in Chile in the uh, early part of 1973. The country was in crisis. There was uh, economic chaos, political chaos, social chaos. Um, the country seemed to be heading towards some sort of crisis. Um, a number of officers within the Chilean military decided to stage a coup d'etat. Um, they deposed uh, and killed the legally elected president, Salvador Allende. And history has not been kind to those army officers who did that. Uh, generally, they're going to be portrayed in the history books, if you ask me, as murderers, um, as human rights violators, as uh, just, you know, your stereotypical Latin American junta of ludicrously right-wing reactionaries who just want to destroy their country's political culture and replace it with rule by the plutocrats and the aristocrats. Um, the people who, who eventually ended up in control of the Chilean government, the army officers and uh, technocrats and that, generally, if you ask me, fit that stereotype. But in early 1973, the people who were actually involved in the coup didn't necessarily fit that stereotype at all. They were soldiers who simply looked at their country and said, look, something's got to give here. This is, this is crazy. We can't go on like this. And a lot of them reluctantly went along with the coup, saying, look, this is uh, the lesser of two evils. The military seizes power, and we restore some sanity to our country, and you know, we'll deal with whatever repercussions come of that. Now, this, in hindsight, turns out to have been a short-sighted view, because what happened was the military seized power in Chile, and then there was something of a power struggle within the Chilean military, and the more sort of, I don't know what you'd call them, idealistic elements of officers, uh, of the officer class who were involved in the coup, were purged, some of them were even killed, uh, by the plain old reactionaries who just wanted to use the crisis as an excuse to crush the trade unions and destroy the uh, democratic republic and, uh, and put all the power back in the hands of the traditional Chilean elites. But there were officers um, who were intimately involved in the coup who actually believed that it was essentially either a coup or total anarchy in, in their country. And a lot of them said afterwards, um, if, I, if I, I knew then what I know now, there's no way I would have gotten involved in this. And, you know, you can take that as sort of a coward's disavowal of something, somebody making a deal with their conscience. Um, or you could take it as a sincere statement that this is not what I anticipated when we seized power. The Chilean military had no history of coups and things like that. It was uh, the, the, That was not the country where that sort of thing happened all the time. It was not Bolivia. Um, so they probably thought that we'd get a, you know, a authoritarian type government for a while and we reestablish stability and that's that. They were wrong, of course, and they were the pawns of the people who simply wanted, the, the, the red reactionaries who simply wanted to crush the Chilean working and you know, even middle classes. Um, so it turns out that their decision, albeit um, made for the, one could say, somewhat right reasons, turns out to be the wrong reasons. It looks as though something similar um, has taken place, uh, or might take place, in Egypt, where the military originally was involved in kicking out Mubarak, and uh, they, it looked as though they wanted a democratic republic. Their, their least favorite candidate, Morsi, got elected, but they didn't do anything about that until he decided to completely screw up um, Egyptian politics and essentially rule totally for the benefit of his own supporters that they, you know, frustratedly, I guess, booted him out too. And now they're probably thinking, all right, maybe democracy is not such a great fit for our society yet. We may have to sort of guide it or whatever. That's the idealistic sort of view of the Egyptian military, because remember, they did actually turn on Mubarak. They helped kick out the general who had become nothing more than an autocrat. Um... 
Now this has to do, I guess, with all this, uh, all these various instances of low-level soldiers basically blowing the whistle on, you know, high-level uh, misdeeds or non-deeds or whatever. The ethics of it. I think that history has proven that the soldiers are better off out of politics regardless of their motives. Um, even if they get involved in politics and going to WikiLeaks is getting involved in politics, um, if they get involved in politics they either screw it up or they set dangerous precedents. I believe that going to WikiLeaks would constitute an idealistic move, but you can actually get involved in some, in some pretty awful stuff for idealistic reasons. For example, um, I am not a big fan of Richard Nixon, but I believe that a lot of the things that he did, he did for idealistic reasons. Um, he did he did them out of patriotic reasons. He honestly had nothing personal to gain from any of it, but um, you know, bombing Cambodia and uh, Watergate and all that kind of thing was extra legal. He shouldn't have done any of those sorts of things, but he didn't have anything to gain from doing that. He simply thought that his country was in a crisis and that he should do this. It's kind of the same thing. Do you obey the law? Um, a soldier does as he's told. If he doesn't do as he's told, then you know all kinds of really awful things can happen that he may not be able to control himself, as in the case of Chile or as in the case of Egypt. Um, if um, we're allow if, if the military are allowed to make those sorts of decisions, then I think that they inevitably screw it up, and the, the times where military involvement in politics actually turns out to have been a good thing are few and far between. I'm not saying that they never happen, but it's, it's generally, if you ask me, a good rule of thumb for the army. As long as you're wearing the uniform, a soldier should stay out of politics. Period. End of story. Um... And uh, I think, you know, if you compare, say, two countries like India and Pakistan, uh, India has a modern democracy, Pakistan does not, because Pakistan has all kinds of military involvement in politics, and India does not. In, in India, the military is even more subservient to the civilian authorities than it is in most Western countries. They simply do as they're told, uh, and that's the way things should be. Um, as for the law, well, it depends on... Whether or not a law is the law, it depends on, uh, well, whether or not you should obey the law depends on what your definition of the law is, or legality is. For example, civil disobedience, you're disobeying a law. You're not disobeying the law. <laughs> there is a big difference. Um, Gandhi and Martin Luther King had to make sure that their followers were highly disciplined and weren't going to just go on a rampage and start looting and raping and killing and things like that, uh, because they weren't so much attacking the law, i.e. legality itself, as they were pointing out one law or a few laws that they didn't like and they thought were unjust. unjust. Uh, plus, the normal modern sense of what constitutes legality would make things like the fugitive slave law, um, apartheid, or the Nuremberg Laws, all sort of illegal, illegitimate laws, simply because we, we now have of the people, by the people, for the people, etc. The law is in your own interest. When you have a law that is specifically targeted to not be in your interest, then generally the thrust of modern thinking is that it's not a legitimate law. Um, you don't have the actual right to rise up against a law that has... Um, not singled you out, uh, at least terribly blatantly for abuse, um, in the same way as, say, a Jim Crow law would, or uh, um, the Nuremberg laws would. Uh, they wouldn't be considered laws in the normal modern sense, and they we wouldn't have the authority, the same authority in opposing laws today as we would, say, if we opposed the Nuremberg laws. We have to decide what we mean by a law before we make our decisions on whether or not it's legal to oppose the law, or a law. But it's an interesting uh, topic, and I don't think it's ever going to go away. It's probably going to be talked about uh, long after uh, anyone debating it now is gone. Good subject.